Okay, Glass, beam me to Paris. While I'm gone, pay the bills, secure the house, and record new episodes of Big Bang Theory. Okay, Glass, scan audience for criminals, drug users, and digital music pirates. <laughs> Now send the results to the FBI. Okay, Glass, start talk. None of the commands you just heard are real commands for Google Glass, but they are meant to demonstrate a few of the reactions that people have to it. As a Glass explorer, I was invited to test the hardware and the software for Glass, provide that feedback to Google, and they would use it toward improving the product for its release next year. I thought that's what I signed on for. <laughs> but in the time I've been an explorer, the numerous um, unexpected reactions to Glass have sent me instead on a journey of exploring human reactions to technology, their interactions, their expectations, and their fears. I'll take a moment just to tell you what Glass can currently do so that you have some context. I can control it with my finger or my voice. I can take pictures and record you. I can do Google searches and uh, get directions, step-by-step -step directions by bike or walking or driving. Or <clears throat> And I can also make phone calls and send messages to people. The feature most unique to Glass is the hands-free first-person vantage point it gives you. And that's the part that's revolutionizing a number of industries. You have surgery and healthcare, um, training and education, disability assistance, and gaming. And The functions that people react to the most, however, are actually not new or Glass-specific. The ability to record or smart technology that learns your behavior and serves up personalized content, voice and facial recognition, all exist now on smartphones and televisions. Let's see, where are they? <clears throat> Oh, yes. So the... Now I lost it entirely. <laughs> Sorry, I have a lot going on in my head right now. <laughs> Luckily, this demonstrates part of my point about technology. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All righty. <laughs> We good? Can you hear me? All right. Great. Hope you gave me extra minutes. <laughs> uh, the difference between the devices I just mentioned, smartphones, televisions, game systems, is that glass puts any kind of issue at hand quite literally in your face. And at least that's what I've surmised after talking to a lot of people. As a glass tester, I've witnessed a variety of reactions. People have, will dive on the floor behind things. They'll block their face, disguise their voice, all because they think it's recording at all times, and that doesn't shut off. I'm just a walking video camera. And glass has sparked hours of conversations with dozens of people from every walks of life about any subject you can think of, <laughs> um, definitely around privacy and security, government transparency, the NSA comes up a lot. Uh, one of those long conversations started with a cabbie in San Francisco who insisted I had scanned his face, identified that he had a criminal record, and sent his exact location to the FBI. But there are also fans of glass, <laughs> extreme fans in some cases. At a conference I was at, I kept getting phone numbers and hotel keys, and they didn't even know my name. They just wanted to be closer to it and see what it might do next. 
and that's the thing with glass, is people keep expecting it to, to act on its own. <clears throat> Excuse me. They use a lot of it and they when they react. The, uh, sorry. The thing is, I don't remember reactions like this when I was growing up with my ridiculously huge word processor in college or when I whipped out my little professor in uh, grade school. No one ducked behind a bookshelf or accused my mustache calculator of wrongdoing. So all of these reactions were new to me. I'd never had a device that elicited so much, in some cases, hatred, in some cases, celebrity love. So it started me doing a lot of research and also inquiring further when people reacted. And as, it, as you may suspect, the fear of new technology is certainly not new to 2013, and it's not specific to wearable technology. Uh, the advent of air travel or the Industrial Revolution had us talking about playing God or machines replacing humans. The first use of the word robot was written in a play in 1920, nearly 100 years ago. But if we look at the technology that is emerging just now, Google Glass, smartwatches, other wearables, the 3D printer, and the blue-collar robot, the invisible bike helmet, which was just announced this week, actually, and long-term memory implants. We now have machines that identify and recognize objects and faces that we can control with our voices and motion. And we even put a driverless car on the road. Even if you're one of the people who have been counting down the day that you could talk to your wrist and pull the car around, or clone your favorite action figure, this list is still going to elicit a number of reactions. You may look at it and, and be in awe of how far we've come, how much we've accomplished, what we're capable of. You may look at this list and say, I can't wait till there's holodecks and hovercrafts and time machines on here. You might look at this list and say, what happens when an egomaniac with a penchant for world domination gets their hands on some of these? Or you'll look at this list and you'll be ready to toss your TiVos and tablets and head for the hills. And that's the pattern that I kept noticing and that kept repeating itself in history books and cybernetics debates, history and film and literature. And when you talk to people, there's this assumption that when it comes to advancement, we really only have two possible options, two paths that we can take. We can fully assimilate or we can unplug completely. And I thought these two reactions were kind of extreme and that there wouldn't, weren't any other options. But everyone always said, well, I either have to jump on board or, or resist entirely. So I took a closer look at the people who might be following one of these two paths. Of those fully assimilating, you have your general technophiles, people who love their gadgets. You have uh, techies and trekkies, and that superhero set, which is a kid who might put on glass and say, hey glass, make it me a superhero, or beam me to Paris. You also have trend hoppers who say, well, Dookie has a pair, I want one. And of course, people who benefit from the technology. Of the people who are ready to take the red pill, you have people who resist or fear any new technology, not necessarily just glass. You have people who aren't really averse, but they have all the, they're overwhelmed with everything they have in their house already, and they don't want to add one more thing. And of course, there's people already worried about what video games or social media or cell phones, how they're impacting our society already. So they don't want to add to the pile until we figure some of that out. And there are people very concerned with their privacy, the security of our identity. They don't want to be recorded or tracked or have files kept on them, and they're saying, back off, big brother. And then you have this elusive group that think they, the machines, are replacing us. 
But technology advances despite our worries. Why does it keep going and growing when we have these concerns? Well, the obvious answer is because of what it does. It either solves a problem or it makes things easier for us. Just the other day, I actually read a story about a woman who got to try out glass and she's quadriplegic. She was able to take the first picture she's been able to take in over 20 years by herself. So she started taking pictures and, and recording videos, sharing them with friends and family, making phone calls, using apps, all without anyone else's help. And this gave her back her independence that she hadn't had in years changing what she'll be able to do for herself for the rest of her life. And I could relate to that story personally. I have what's called a bone-anchored hearing aid. It's Baja for short. It's a device that you click into a two-inch titanium screw that's drilled in the, the ear, behind the ear, actually, the bone behind your ear. I have that because of a condition I have, I have called cholesteatoma. And that's a cyst that's in your ear and it eats away at bone until it's removed. In my case, it keeps regrowing and they keep removing it. So I'm missing a lot of normal ear pieces, which is probably why I can't put a headset on my ear. <laughs> but um, because of that, I can't use a normal hearing aid. So the Baja option came up about seven years ago. And the doctors told me this will allow you to hear and not complicate your condition. So I said, sign me up. And they explained that it would amplify sound that's conducted from the bone behind your ear instead of inside of it. Interesting enough, Google Glass leverages similar technology. Places the audio piece of the apparatus against the bone behind your ear, amplifying the sound there. So you can hear people when you make a phone call, and your search results are read to you that way. And of course, with glass, there's no drill or screws involved, so don't worry about that. <laughs> um, in any case, with my condition, in most of the world, cholesteatoma has a 100% mortality rate. So it would be difficult for me to stand here, well, impossible in fact, and say that I haven't personally benefited from advancements in technology, surgery, and medicine. And I'm all jacked up and bionic already, so wearing glass isn't going to be the leap for me as it might be for one of you. And I'm going to approach all technology differently than you might. Because I'm the sum of years of my experiences, just as you are of yours. And the thing is, the sum of someone's multiple experiences is unlikely to be very simple. In my case, I had the Baha, I decided to be a glass tester, but I am concerned about my identity and my privacy. So I'm going to fall somewhere in the middle of that spectrum and not at one end or the other. And I suspect most of us do. I don't think most of us fall into one of those extreme categories. And therefore, I think we have more than two options when it comes to technology as we navigate forward. The question is, how can we better expose and create those options? Well, for starters, I think we need to understand and own our role as humans with technology. We create the technology we love and fear. When we use that elusive they instead of we, we end up taking ourselves out of the equation and we create a cyborg-like fear. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's when we use all the it's and they's that we forget that we're steering the crazy train. That there is no smartphone whiling away its days in a warehouse somewhere creating other smartphones. And a nanny cam doesn't decide to pop over the locker room and record people undressing. That requires a human to make that decision, place that, and control that. If we look at what we're really worried about, what will someone do with my information? What will they do with that piece of glass on their head? What we're worried about is not the device, but the person behind it. 
<laughs> so what can we do to carve out some of those options for ourselves? Well, we can educate ourselves. I did a little of that today with Laban's speech. If you're worried about privacy, look into privacy-aware architecture, incognito features. If you don't know all that your smartphone does, find out. And then once you're armed with information, what then? Well, I think you share it. Share it with all of us. I think you can email, tweet, and TED Talk your way to where we are still advancing our quality of life, even while we're addressing those issues we're so worried about. I don't think we have to be the people in the boardroom deciding funding or the people building the technology to play a role in how it evolves. I think we, can cre we have created all those things you saw on that list. The robot, glass, the helmet, the machines that talk and recognize us. If we can create all of that, we can create a framework to support that. Gaining the culturally desired control that we so desire to use for its use and direction. What I think it, we have here is not just the opportunity to advance our technology, but to advance ourselves and our relationship to it. Okay, Glass, end talk and fire up the TARDIS. <laughs> <laughs>